2009 on the Hart family tragedy and the Chris Benoit suicide, which was a double murder uh, suicide. It was really intense sitting down with that conversation. because, And one of the things that I mentioned uh, in that conversation, you know, we can make all the assumptions we want. We can draw our own conclusions about things like the death of Chris Benoit and Owen Hart and the Hart family tragedy, which it has been deemed, even though it probably isn't, a tragedy in the minds of a lot of Canadian wrestling fans, which I'll probably get a lot of heat from for referring to it as a tragedy. The thing is, uh, we weren't there, and that's one thing that I brought up to Scott Keith in the interview, and we don't really know uh, from a first-hand perspective what was really going on behind closed doors. Uh, when you talk about the Hart family or Chris Benoit, the thing is we're just drawing our own conclusions, and that's what we're going to be doing until the end of time uh, with professional wrestling. And that's the thing about professional wrestling that I really appreciate, the diversity of opinions that you will hear from either radio shows, columnists, journalists like myself, or the everyday wrestling fan, because everybody seems uh, to have an opinion. You have 50% of the fans who are fans of Bret Hart. You have 50% of the fans who can't stand Bret Hart. And, you know, being from Canada, you would expect... Uh, that I would be the biggest Bret Hart fan. A lot of people tell me I should support Bret Hart. I do uh, support Bret Hart. I just don't support Bret Hart 100%. I don't support or condone a lot of the decisions that Bret Hart made in his life. Being around Bret Hart was not a pleasure of mine because it was very difficult uh, being around him, being around a lot of his family because they had a lot of opinions in relation to how Bret Hart was treated. Some of them agreed. Uh, went as far as to agree with how Bret Hart was treated because he was leaving the company after 14 years and the Big Show believed uh, that Bret Hart was leaving the company so he got what he got and Triple H and Shawn Michaels believed he got what he got. The thing was, even Earl Hebner who rang the bell who I interviewed on Bret Hart believed the same thing. Yeah, they were employees so they obviously had to condone uh, the actions of Shawn, Michael, or Shawn Michaels, Vince McMahon, the whole DX, the Hart Foundation, they obviously had to support uh, Vince McMahon of this, but they were right, um, because, you know, if you're leaving the company, why should you go out on top when you're leaving for the rival company over a dispute over $9 million over a three-year period, making $3 million per every year uh, that you're under contract with the company for the duration of three years? I don't think you should, and I don't think Bret Hart should have got away with leaving the company on top like he wanted to do in Montreal, so he got what he got, and he got what he deserved in my opinion, and that's why a lot of people have told me I should be supporting Bret Hart. Let me sum it up to you this way. If it came down to a fight between Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart, and I witnessed the fight, say, in a bar, I would help Shawn Michaels before I would ever help Bret Hart, because I know uh, that Shawn Michaels is a constant performer, and even though I didn't really agree with a lot of things Shawn Michaels did, the thing was Shawn Michaels took his ball and he bounced it in his court, and he took every opportunity and seized every opportunity Vince McMahon gave to him. Bret Hart did the same thing. Uh, but eventually, ego played a factor on Bret Hart's decisions, and the ego of Bret Hart got the better of him, and that's why uh, karma has a funny thing of coming around. You know, karma always pops up and uh, catches us off guard, and obviously that's why Bret Hart had this happen to him. I had this conversation with a girl a couple of weeks ago about how Bret Hart's karma obviously has come back to haunt him, and this cancer is just a form of karma, you know, playing on Bret Hart's mind. And I'm really happy uh, that he, you know, got over this because a lot of people were uncertain about the future of Bret Hart. And there still has to be that little bit of minor uncertainty uh, coming from Bret Hart. You know, you go through all this cancer, you know, you, you talk about all the possibilities of what the outcome of it could be, you know, what the outcome of the surgery could be. After having done everything, you obviously have a huge reputation with Canadian wrestling fans. They referred to Bret Hart on the news reports as the Canadian wrestling legend, which no doubt he is. I don't know how a lot of American fans feel about Bret Hart, even though they received him pretty well when he returned in 2010, four years after his Hall of Fame induction. It's been 10 years uh, since Bret Hart was put in the Hall of Fame, and 10 years is a long time, and after 10 years, it's believed that you should do something else uh, with your life. I had that conversation with Paul Elring back in 2007, 2008, when I interviewed the Legion of Doom, and he was pretty right. He was pretty dead on. You know, the nail in the coffin pretty much had been driven into his wrestling career, and he said, you know, after 10 years, you know, you do something else with your life. He opened up a restaurant. Bret Hart uh, was the uh, manager of the Calgary Hitman, which is the farm team for the Calgary Flames, I believe, in the NHL. Uh, the thing is, you do something else with your life. And Bret Hart tried to do things. Uh, you know, outside of wrestling with his life, he was the uh, genie in Aladdin for a theatrical production. He was the manager of the Calgary Hitmen, uh, which are a pretty well-known farm team for the uh, Calgary Flames. The thing is, he tried to do things with his life. But, you know, Shawn Michaels said something really interesting a couple of years ago when he retired. He said, he said you know, after doing something for over 25 years, how can you just walk away from it? And Bret Hart was gone for over 12 years. So I think coming back in 2010, even though it may not have buried the hatchet between himself and the McMahon family for, you know, entirely for the last number of years, 
at least it gave Bret Hart some little bit of satisfaction, you know, knowing he came back and did what he did. He got back in the ring with Vince McMahon for about a 10-minute match. The Hart family served as lumberjacks on the outside of the ring. He helped with the Hart dynasty, Tyson Kidd, and D.H. Smith, the, the son of the British Bulldog, who he was really proud uh, to be in the corner of. And obviously, he was really proud to be in the corner of uh, Tyson Kidd and Natalia, his uh, niece, uh, to support them. And then they had him be the United States champion, defeating the Miz in that little bit of a feud. And then he said, you know, it was a great run. It was time for him to step down. And he, then he started doing things uh, for the network. So they came up with things for Bret Hart to do. Uh, you know, it wasn't the five-star return of The Rock from 2011, which happened a year after Bret Hart came back to the wrestling business. And we never did see, say, Bret Hart versus The Rock off the returns of The Rock and Bret Hart from four or five years ago. Uh, but the thing is, even though it wasn't a return you would expect for Bret Hart to have, the thing was he did. Uh, make a return, and obviously he was able to bury the hatchet, you know, patching things up with Shawn Michaels, it was a little bit lackluster, I was kind of hoping uh, Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels were going to come to blows with the, even if Shawn Michaels didn't put a hand on Bret Hart because of his concussion, which obviously plays a significant role in why Bret Hart has the role he does uh, in the wrestling industry, after having a concussion, you're never the same, just as you are never the same from knee injuries and back injuries, you're never going to come back 100%, and I remember that match that Bret Hart had uh, with Goldberg when he suffered really the first major injury, which was obviously a career-ending injury for Bret Hart when Goldberg kicked him in the head on that episode of Nitro, which I believe was back in 1999. As I mentioned, you know, weeks for weeks here on this show that I used to come home on Wednesday and Thursdays and watch Monday Night Nitro, the replays, and I used to see these matches, and I remember seeing Bret Hart versus Goldberg very clearly. Bret Hart comes off the ropes, here's Goldberg with the bicycle roundhouse kick right to the head, right to the temple is where he caught him. Uh, Bret Hart goes down, and that's when he had his final wrestling match. And I remember seeing Bret Hart's final match here in Newfoundland when he faced Austin and McFoley uh, with the brother Owen in tag team match. They were the first main event of the evening. The second of that was The Undertaker and Vader. And, you know, after seeing these matches, obviously the years Bret Hart has been in the wrestling business has played a toll on his career, and a lot of people are in support of everything Bret Hart has done. I'm just not one of those people that are in support of the mistakes Bret Hart made and some of the decisions he made outside of wrestling, even with his personal life, because there are a lot of things uh, Bret Hart obviously has to second-guess himself on and obviously regrets having done, uh, but obviously this second chance in life now will give Bret Hart a chance to redeem himself and kind of reflect back on some of the things that he did in his life and probably, you know, correct some of these mistakes. There still is time at 58 years of age for Bret Hart to kind of turn his life around, and I'm hoping uh, that Bret Hart, if not doing a 360, will at least pull a 180 and try to, you know, create a different image for himself, because sometimes he was never really the most pleasant individual to ever have been around or to have profiled in the wrestling business. I have much rather preferred profiling people like Ted DiBiase and Jake the Snake Roberts, because they were really nicer people to sit down uh, with an interview than I ever was, a member of the Hart family or Bret Hart himself, hearing the stories uh, about Bret Hart made me feel very uncomfortable on times, and I'm going to be honest with you, it was never really a comfortable situation, uh, sitting down with the Hart family, you know, hearing their perspectives on the wrestling business, some of the situations they had to deal with, the death of the British Bulldog and Owen Hart, the two deaths, which obviously played a huge factor on how the Hart family feels uh, these days, and obviously how Bret Hart was treated with this Hall of Fame induction happening 10 years ago, I thought about that. Uh, the other day in 2006, he was the headliner for the Hall of Fame induction ceremony the night before uh, WrestleMania 22. Here we are with the uh, all the Hall of Fame inductees on the stage at WrestleMania 22. And then Bret Hart says because of animosity, he chose not to attend WrestleMania because of how feelings were running very high, intense feelings in the locker room. And I said, you know, this is completely ridiculous. Again, we're reflecting back on a lot of the mistakes uh, that Bret Hart made, which a lot of the news reporters will shy away from because it's not really what the uh, circumstance is Bret Hart is faced with, and that's obviously not what the focus is. The cancer uh, is what we're focusing on here, but I think that, you know, that's what makes me uh, sound very different. You know, I'll give Bret Hart credit for his fight with cancer. You know, he deserves all the credit in the world. What I won't give Bret Hart credit for is the fact that, you know, he made a lot of mistakes in his life, and I think he's been just being overrated a little bit too much and being talked about probably more than what he deserves to be being talked about. I mean, we're not talking about Jake the Snake Roberts, we're not talking about Roddy Piper as much, you know, and they all had fights with cancer, and they all beat uh, cancer to a certain extent, and, you know, there are minimal reports on wrestlers from the 80s like Bret Hart and Roddy Piper. Why is all the focus on Bret Hart? Obviously because he's a really big name, but don't you think he's being a little bit overrated a little bit too much? I don't think there's anything wrong or anything right pretty much uh, that I'm saying in this because it works both ways. I could be right 
or I could be wrong. And I think that for the most part, there's nothing wrong in what I've said about Bret Hart because, you know, and a lot of it comes from, you know, me not being the biggest uh, Bret Hart fan, but I want to wish him well in his recovery from cancer. It's going to take some time. He's never going to be uh, the same ever again. But I think that we will see Bret Hart once again redeem his uh, reputation for being known as the best there is, the best there was, and the best there ever will be. I've had a lot of conversations about Bret Hart over the last couple of months. I haven't regretted any of them. It's just my feelings about Bret Hart may not be the same as millions of other Canadian fans out there, and that's kind of weird. I know, uh, coming from a Canadian wrestling fan like myself, who's lived in Canada pretty much his entire life, at least 85 to 90 percent of my life I've lived here in Canada, and you would expect uh, that it would be a big, big Bret Hart fan. But you know, at the end of the day, I just can't bring myself to like anything Bret Hart did, you know, in the wrestling business because of the way uh, that he perceived himself. But I do uh, wish him all the best, you know, with his successful surgery, being 99 percent sure that he's going to recover.